pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this beautiful morning, this time that we can come together to worship you, to praise you, and, and uh, lift up our, our hearts and our voices to you. And truly, you are holy, Father. We pray your blessings on this uh, time this morning, on our worship team as they, uh, as they lead us in worship, that it would be a time that we truly reflect on you and focus on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <coughs> this is a song we used to sing way back. I'll be listening, so you got to get your breath going in there, but it's, it's the Savior's calling, and we're going to be listening. <laughs> Yeah. 
speaking to me. It's just such a heartfelt song and breathing in God, his presence. And he's our daily bread and that, you know, he's our every word we breathe in and he's our every breath. So this song is breathe.
You are every breath we take. We need to think of that, Lord. You're every breath we take. We love your presence, Lord. We love to know you are with us at all times. Without you, we cannot live. I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you for each person that's here this day. Bless each one of them, Lord, for the devotion to you and coming out and just wanting to be with you in fellowship with others. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with Pastor Rick as he gives us a message. Father, it's so important that you, this is our daily bread. This is what we need every day, Lord. So let it sink in, let us nourish us, strengthen us, encourage us in everything <coughs> we do and say. So I give this to you in your precious, loving name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Don't sound so cheerful. Well, good morning. Oh, that's more like it. Somebody's awake here. Did you get your coffee okay? Was it strong enough? Could have used a few more shots. How how you do that is you take one of those cups and you do four ounces, and then you take another new cup and do four more ounces. But it's strong, <laughs> sometimes. Well, I hope everybody's had a good week this week. Is uh, back today, going, continuing through our study of James. Uh, I have some, thank you. Um, one of the songs we sing is being close to God, wanting, to be, wanting God to be close to us and everything. Do you really want to walk close with the Lord? Really? Want him to be a part of your life? Uh, breathing in. Someone, someone once said, uh, I'm trying to think of it now. <laughs> what is more important? Reading the word or prayer? What's more important? Both. Reading the word or prayer? And uh, I, I can't remember who the pastor was that said this. He says, uh, well then, let me ask you a question. What's more important, breathing in or breathing out? Think about that. They're both so important. So this morning, let's breathe in the word. 
and, um, and listen to what James has to say on, uh, this is a topic that a lot of people don't like to hear about. It's called controlling your tongue. <laughs> and uh, the first 12 verses of James, uh, chapter 3, uh, deal with the subject of the tongue. Yeah. Have you ever thought about your tongue? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we got an honest person here today. Yeah. Thought about you, you know you know your tongue is a very small muscle located in your mouth. And and your tongue is very vital for chewing, for tasting, swallowing food. Uh, and for speech as well. However, your tongue can be just as hurtful as it can be helpful. For example, if you're working on something and you hit your thumb with a hammer, as I have done before, uh, or if you're Anger hits kind of a high level. Been there, done that. That, that small muscle in your mouth is going to reveal the negative side of your nature. Someone once said, watch your tongue. It's a wet place where it is easy to slip. <clears throat> James now has already written about the tongue and in chapter 1, uh, in verse 26, James 1, 26, he tells us that if a person thinks he is religious but can't control his tongue, then he is deceiving himself. He's fooling himself. His religion is worthless. Vern McClellan wrote a book entitled Proverbs, Promises, and Principles. And on each page, there's a, there's a proverb, and then, there's, then he gives a principle from the Word of God, and then there is a, or a promise from God's Word, and then there's a principle. And uh, in one of the pages I was reading this past week, here's the proverb. He who speaks with a forked tongue is probably a snake in the grass. Here's the promise. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 3. says, whoever controls his mouth protects his own life. Whoever has a big mouth comes to ruin. And then in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, he tells us, careless words stab like a sword, but the words of wise people is healing. Now, here is the principle. Medical doctors measure physical health by how the tongue looks. The great physician measures spiritual tongue by how the tongue acts. The most untamable thing in the world has its den just behind the teeth. Because the tongue has so much uh, power, such tremendous amount of power to help or to hurt there's three principles that James brings out in uh, chapter 3, the first five verses of chapter 3, about controlling our tongues. In fact, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to read from the New King James Version, chapter uh, 3, verses 1 through the first part of verse 5, but I'll read the whole uh, verse 5, but then next week we're going to pick up with Controlling the Tongue Part 2, uh, and we'll start off at, at verse 5, and we'll go through verse 12. But for today, let's look at verses 1 through 5. It says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word... He is a perfect, that word perfect means mature. He is a perfect man, a mature man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, if we put bits in horses' mouths 
that they may obey us and we turn their, uh, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how a forest, see how great a forest a little fire kindles. The first principle that James brings up in, uh, in verse 1 is this, that we must be unselfish. We must be unselfish in the use of our tongues. In verse 1, James says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. James issues a warning about having this quick ambition to become a teacher. Now, understand something. James is not forbidding the use of, of the gift of teaching by a person who's been called by God to teach the Word. Instead, it's simply a, a warning that the teaching ministry is not to be taken lightly. There's a tendency of a lot of people to become teachers because they desire to have that prominent position. In Jewish culture, being a rabbi was a position of power. It was a p position of privilege, a position of respect. And then talking about the Pharisees, though, Jesus in Matthew chapter 23, verses 6 and 7, says this. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called by men, rabbi, rabbi. Now, that word rabbi means master or teacher. In the uh, Old Testament, it literally means my great one. Jesus told his disciples not to be called rabbi or teacher. I want us to look, uh, take your Bibles, if you will, please, and look at Matthew, Matthew chapter 23. And uh, I want to read verses 8 through 12 uh, for us. Matthew 23, beginning in verse 8. This is Jesus talking, to, and he's, uh, as he's teaching his disciples, he's talking. And verse 8 says, but, uh, but you do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he is who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. You see what James is saying there? says we're not to, to uh, be called teachers. We're not, we're not to, to, to want to, to have that position of, of exalting ourselves and being prominent and everything. And, and uh, that, that's exactly what uh, the rabbis were doing, uh, or the rabbis, the Pharisees were doing. They wanted that place of prominence. They wanted to, 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 to be a teacher so that they could look good to everyone. Look how smart I am. Look how great I am. James says, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And it's a tremendous responsibility to teach the Word of God. So teachers must be prepared not only to teach God's Word, but also to live God's Word, to practice what they preach.
because teaching is primarily done uh, through verbal communications, it's very important for teachers to control their tongues also. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, teachers get all excited in, in, the, in the process of teaching a, a, a passage of Scripture or something, and they get... Sometimes they just kind of get carried away and, and uh, they embellish things more than what they should be. They, they, they build up things more than what they really are just to get a point across. James says, be careful of that. Sometimes teachers operating in the flesh, they'll promote their own agenda and their own opinions in such a way that it causes confusion or causes conflict or division in the church. However, spiritual teachers, spiritual teachers will teach things that promote understanding, agreement, and unity within the body. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. James is saying that, that, folks, we ought to all live in harmony with one another. We ought to be sympathetic toward one another. We ought to love each other. We ought to have compassion for one another. We ought to be humble. We ought to be humble. In James chapter 3, verse 1, James warns us not to be overly ambitious to become teachers because he says this, knowing that we shall receive <clears throat> a stricter judgment. Those who teach will receive, uh, will be judged more severely. You know, in the Old Testament, God was so plain about shepherds that he would call to shepherd his flock, that uh, prophets that he would call to, to, uh, to teach his word. And that's what a prophet did. A, a prophet wasn't just someone who went around foretelling the future. A prophet is one that speaks the word of God, that tells that, that he receives a word from God and then he shares it as God tells him to. And God was very serious about prophets who twisted his word or who uh, said things that he didn't say. And, and uh, he gave him a stern warning about what would happen to him. Very strict judgment would come upon them. Now, we're, we're all, every one of us, are going to be judged by our words. We're going to be judged about how we treat others through our verbal communication. But none are going to be judged more strictly than teachers. They will be held to a higher degree of accountability. It is, it's such a blessing. And to some folks, it is so exhilarating to, to teach the Word of God, to share God's Word with, with a group of people. However, teaching done for selfish ambition, for uh, a personal agenda, will bring on a harsh judgment. So why is it? Why is it that teachers will be uh, held more accountable will be judged more strictly. It's because of the influence the teachers have in their role of teaching. If, if we as teachers claim to know God's word enough to teach it to others, then we're held more accountable to teach it correctly, to be true to God's word. With Increased influence comes increased accountability. In fact, uh, you know, Jesus said that the more 
that you are given, the more uh, that you're held responsible for that, for, the more you're held accountable for that. So G James is really not trying to discourage folks from becoming teachers. He's simply reminding us of the great responsibility that there is in teaching and about the potential problems that will, that will come as a result of that. So the, the desire, the desire to be in the spotlight and to be noticed as a person of prominence and, and a person of authority is just as much a problem today as it was in James's day. We, we see that even today in, in, in a lot of churches, a lot of, of, of areas where uh, people say, I've, I've been called to teach, I've been called to preach the word of God, but then they veer way off track. I was talking to a young man this morning uh, who his truck broke down in front of our, just about the same time I pulled up to the church, his truck broke down. And uh, so he and I got to talk and uh, uh, he was a veteran, Air Force, and we sit there and we talk. We had we we talked about a lot of things, but uh, he was stationed in Hawaii and I was stationed in Hawaii, and and he, we were sharing about a lot of the places that we'd gone to and the things we'd seen and everything. And and in the course of our conversation, then then uh, I had uh, gave him a, a New Testament Bible that is a special edition we just ordered in for uh, veterans, and uh, I I gave it to him. As, as we were talking about, about the Lord and about our relationship, what it should be. And he mentioned the name of a very popular preacher of the day. And uh, he says, well, uh, do, do you know him? I said, well, yes, I know him. Well, what do you think about him? He shouldn't have asked me that. Because I told him, well, you know, what, what, does he teach right? He shouldn't have asked me that because I told him. You, you, you've got to take a teacher or pastor that teaches, listen to what they say, but don't just take off and say, well, because he said it, it's true. Because he is so uh, important and he's so widely popular, has thousands of people in his church, doesn't mean that he's telling the truth. You've got to take the Word of God, and you've got to make sure that everything that he teaches lines up with the Word of God. I think in the New Testament, they call it the Bereans. You've got to be as the Bereans do. They went back, and no matter who it was that was teaching, they went back and they got into the Word daily and examined it and made sure that what they were hearing from the teacher is what was in the Word of God. And that's what we have to do. And so I told him, I said, just go by what the Word says what the Word says. He asked me a funny question. He says, do you have a special Halloween message today? <laughs> no. I said, we just go through the Word. We're just teaching the Word of God. That's all. When you read the Word, just read the Word of God. You want the truth? It's right there. Read the Word of God. So James warns us about having that ambition to be a teacher. Now, man, if God puts that on a person's heart to teach, oh, you better go for it. If God's calling you to be a teacher of the Word of God, then, then you need to be, you need to be uh, faithful to the calling. You need to answer the call. But you need to understand that God's going to hold you to a higher degree of accountability. 
young, immature believers need to grow in their faith and become mature before they can be allowed to assume the role of a teacher. We've had, I've had folks before in, in our uh, last church, we had a young man that just wanted to teach. Wonder, let me be a teacher. Let me be a teacher. Let me be a teacher. And I says, I can't do that. Why not? I says, well, number one, uh, you're not here all the time. <laughs> number two, when you are here, you're always late. And how long have you been a Christian now? And I wouldn't allow that. And we've had uh, some in, in our church here that have wanted to teach, wanted to have a teaching ministry. But they're young in the ministry. They need to mature a little more. Besides, they had some pretty weird ideas. <laughs> Pastors, teachers, and, and, uh, and leaders of the church have a responsibility to, to guide, to teach these young men and women to the point where they are qualified to be teachers. And that's why according to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, one of the qualifications for an overseer, or overseers were pastors, elders of the church, bishops, is that they are not a novice, not a new convert. People who are immature may have a desire to teach so they can be in the spotlight, have more influence with others, and even promote their own agenda. We must be unselfish with our tongues. We must teach what the Word of God teaches, not what we want. Let whatever we say be said to encourage, to build up one another, not to puff ourselves up. Not to puff ourselves up. Be unselfish in the use of our tongue. Second point is this. James says in verse 2, we must be careful in the use of our tongues. We must be careful in the use of our tongue. James now takes us past the specific ministry of teaching to the general area of our conversations. James says in the first part of verse 2, for we all stumble in many ways. In other words, we all make mistakes. Anyone here that never makes a mistake, that has never stumbled in any way in their life? None of us. Well, except for one. <laughs> Bless you, my brother. <laughs> I'll be praying for you a lot this week. <laughs> no, we all, we all make mistakes, don't we? The word stumble that James is using there is from the Greek word. It means to trip up, to offend. It, 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 and it's really, it's a synonym also for sin. Stumble is a synonym for, for sinning. We, we all sin with our tongues. And one time or another, we've all sinned with our tongues. Someone once said this. It's funny how a sharp tongue can cut one's own throat. Think about that. There are several ways which we can sin with our tongues. We can gossip. We can lie. We can say hurtful things to or about another person. We can deceive people. I think one of the most serious Sins or serious ways that we sin with our tongue is found in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, 
the first part of verse 7. Exodus 20, verse 7, the first part says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. It's the most serious way we can sin with our tongue. So in what ways can we take the name of God in vain? By using his name disrespectfully. Using the word God and the word damn in one, as one word. OMG. You know what OMG stands for? That's taking God's name in vain. Sometimes I, somebody will say something and they'll say, oh my God. And I'll look at them and I'll say, oh, you're a God. What about my God? By claiming or by swearing on his name. By swearing on God's name, you take his name in vain. I've heard this boy. I swear to God, I'm going to kill you. You're taking God's name in vain. By claiming, listen, this is, this is a biggie. This is a biggie here. By claiming to be a child of God. You know, when you become a child of God, you're adopted into God's family. You take on his name. Everything you do, everything you say is a reflection of your heavenly father. So when we claim to be a child of God, but we live in such a way that it denies God and it denies his power. That, that's interesting to me how people can say I'm a, I'm a Christian but yet go out and live like the world. I believe in the word of God and I believe in this and I, I believe every part of the word of God yet they're selective in their obedience to God's word. The use of the tongue. I, and, and we need to be careful about that. I spent several years in the Navy. I worked in a job field that required a very high security clearance. And I was going through the training. I remember being said in my training class, and, and I'm sure you've heard this phrase before, loose lips sink ships. Loose lips sink ships. I heard that so many times going through that that it was just, you know, they could have tattooed it on me. I would have known it. Listen, loose lips not only sink ships, but they also destroy lives. Many lives are being destroyed by means of malicious talk and gossip. Anytime, listen, anytime we talk about the private affairs of others, when it's not helpful for them, when it's not to protect them, we're gossiping. And it makes no difference if the information is true or not. Anytime you repeat the private affairs of another person, if it's not being done to help or to protect that person, it's nothing more than gossip, pure and simple. And it destroys reputations and it destroys lives. I believe that's one of the reasons why gossiping is so heavily uh, condemned in the Bible. Do you know what one of the most dangerous things in the promotion of gossip is? It's TNT. You ever heard of that? TNT. You know what that stands for? Tongue and telephone. Tongue and telephone. A lot of people are on the phone hours each week gossiping about their brothers or their sisters. 
I knew one lady that, that man, it, something could happen. And a second later, she was on the phone. Did you hear about, did you hear about so-and-so? Hey, let, let me give you a little, little piece of advice. When somebody comes up to you and starts talking about the private affairs of someone else, oh, did you know that so-and-so's doing this and they're having trouble with this and they're doing that? Stop them right there and say, why are you telling me this? Am I part of the problem or part of the solution? If not, then I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to hear about it. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, Proverbs 18, 21, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Vern McClellan wrote in his book, uh, Proverbs, Promises, and Principles, he wrote this, those who gossip usually wind up in their own mouth traps. The best way to save face is to keep the lower part shut. Is it any wonder? You think about this. God is, God is extremely intelligent. He's the one that designed us. Is it any wonder that when he designed us, he, he put our tongues in a place where we could bite them once in a while? James says in verse 2, talking about an uncontrolled tongue, that we all stumble, we all sin in many ways. However, listen, in the remainder of the verse, he writes this, If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. I like the way God's word translation puts it. He says it, it says it like this. If someone doesn't make any mistakes when he speaks, he would be perfect. He would be able to control everything he does. The Greek word for uh, translated perfect, it means mature or complete in character. Our ability to control our tongue is a pretty good sign that we're spiritually mature and able to control our own sinful desires, thus in control of everything we do, able to, to bridle or keep in check our entire bodies. So in order to co control our tongues, we must be unselfish in the use of our tongues. We must be careful in the use of our tongue. And thirdly, we must be beneficial beneficial in the use of our tongue. Verses 3 through 5. In the last part of verse 2, look what James says. He uses that phrase, to bridle the whole body. To bridle the whole body. That introduces the analogy that he's going to use to make his point about how to control our tongue. In verses 3 and 5, James talks about bits and Mouths of horses and rudders on ships. And bits and rudders have one thing in common. They both, though they're very small, give direction to much larger objects than themselves. James uses these illustrations to point out the tremendous power that our tongues have. He writes in verse 3. He says, Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Some of you ride horses. You understand what I'm talking about. When I was in high school, I used to um, go over to a friend of mine's house every weekend. Went over there really for two reasons. Went over, he, he owned a couple of horses. And I loved to ride horses, so I went over there. But also he had a very cute sister. So, you know, 
two and one. That's pretty good. And we used to go horseback riding together. He owned a, like I said, he owned a couple of horses. And I, I would guess that each one of those horses weighed about maybe 800 to 900 pounds. Uh, and, it, and, and, and they were pure muscle and power. All that power was of no benefit to either one of us if it wasn't under control. So when we put a bit, which was attached to a bridle and reins, into that horse's mouth, we would get control on the remainder of his body. Now, the bridle is the harness. It goes over the head of the, of the horse, and it holds that bit in his mouth. And by the same token, we have control of our tongues... If, if, we, if we have control of our tongues, then we'll have no difficulty in controlling our entire bodies and their evil desires. Practicing self-control in all areas of our lives. And like a horse without a bridle, an uncontrolled, untamed tongue means that our life is out of control. James continues in verse 4 with another illustration. <clears throat> he says, look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. The slightest movement of a ship's rudder will control the direction of the entire ship. My first four years in the Navy, I spent on board ships from a, a, a very small ship, they call it an ocean tug, to a major communication relay ship, which was about the size of an aircraft carrier. Several times, we encountered some pretty bad storms, which had some pretty heavy waves and some fierce winds. But the helms, helmsman had control of the direction of the ship by means of that small rudder. Compared to the ship itself, the rudder weighs only a fraction of the weight of that ship. I'll look this up, for example. <clears throat> the ocean liner, RMS Queen Elizabeth, weighs 83,673 tons. 83,673 tons. While the rudder only weighs 140 tons. Vast difference. Vast difference. That ship that I was on, the, the aircraft carrier size weighed about, uh, I would say... Probably 11,700 and some tons. And the rudder weighed just a fraction of that. Just a fraction of that. The rudder on the Queen Elizabeth was less than two tenths of one percent of the total weight, yet the turning of that small rudder controlled the direction of the entire ship, whichever way it was, it was going to go. Now, James uses the phrase there, fierce winds. Kind of gives us a new understanding of control. Listen, regardless of how difficult the circumstances are, how rough the seas are, how fierce the wind is, that rudder, can be controlled by the helmsman. And if it can, the entire ship will stay on course. And likewise, if we control our tongues, when the conversation we're involved in with other people takes a wrong sinful turn, or when we're tempted to engage in gossip, or when we experience times of anger, we can maintain 
if we can control our tongues, we can maintain, maintain control of our entire body. David gives a pretty good example to follow in order to control our tongues in difficult circumstances. He says in Psalm verse, uh, chapter 39, verse 1, Psalm 39, verse 1, he says, he wrote this, I said, I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongues. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle. That's what it takes to guard our ways. It takes a, a conscious muzzle. Arthur Margaret Atwood once said this, If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Now that sounds like pretty good advice. Hey, let's try that this week. Why don't we? For one day. Try to go a full day without saying anything critical or anything bad about anyone. You can make it through the day. Now try it for a week. You can make it through a week. Now try it through for a month. By that time, it'll just come so easy. That's the way you learn to muzzle your mouth to control your tongue. The helmsman of a ship can direct the ship to keep it on a safe course or he can be careless and sink the ship in rocky waters. And in the same way, we can be, uh, make thoughtless statements and damage reputations. Ruin friendships, destroy marriages, or damage our Christian witness. Our tongues have enormous power. And for that reason, James reminds us in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, he says, For every idle word man may speak, they will give account of it on the day of judgment. In James, the first part of verse 5, the last verse of, of uh, this section, uh, James sums up his point. He says this, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Just like the bit in the horse's mouth, just like the rudder on the ship, the tongue can control the course of our lives when James says the tongue boasts great things, he means that it, it can do constructive things. In the same way, the sins of our tongue can be listed, so can the benefits as well. Remember I said a while ago that the tongue can, can uh, destroy lives and ruin marriages and, and, and so on? Well, listen, the tongue can also do this. It can give encouragement. It can provide comfort. It can edify, build up. It can teach the word of God. The tongue can give compliments. It can express love. The tongue can share the kingdom gospel message. Oh, the tongue. <laughs> Such a small muscle with such tremendous power. Power for good, power for evil. And we decide every day, every day we decide if this will be the day for controlling our tongue. A day for taming our tongue. And for us to do that, let's remember those three things. We must be unselfish in the use of our tongues. We must be careful in the use of our tongues. And we must be beneficial in the use of our tongues. Controlling the tongue. That's what James is talking about here. So let me kind of give you a, 
a challenge in the way of a question here. Will you make it your goal this coming week to maintain control of your tongue in every activity you're engaged in and in every conversation you participate in? Now, next week, we'll conclude uh, James's study on controlling the tongue with part two. And we'll be looking at three things that we need to remember about our tongues if we are to control our tongues. But until then, daily, take a day, one day, say nice things about people. Not negative things. One of the things that I used to used to say, some of you that's been here long enough will remember this. Accentuate the positive. Eliminate the negative. Right? Accentuate the positive. Eliminate the negative. Say good things. Say good things about people. Oh, they may do some pretty bad things, but find something good to say about them. It'll make them feel better, but it'll make you feel better as well. I'll tell you, guarantee it. Controlling our tongues. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for, again, for another teaching uh, from James uh, as we go through this study. this teaching on the use of our tongues and uh, such a small, small object of our bodies causes us to uh, trip pretty badly sometimes. But help us, Lord, in this coming week by the enabling power of your Holy Spirit to control our tongues, to be positive with one another, uplifting to one another. Father, bring us back again next week that we can continue our study and learn more about our tongues and, and how we can live our lives in a way that, that we can control those tongues. But we can only do it with your help. So we're asking for that now, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above the heavenly Let's go eat.